Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Hi, today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Rainer Heinzmann from the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. And we discussed exactly how Rainer became such a nifty dance floor mover. When I was in London, I actually went once a week to Imperial College for dancing lessons. And you'll have to watch, listen, to find out precisely what type of dancing Rainer was actually learning. And I asked him why it took him six years to complete his undergraduate studies. Well, yeah. If you call that undergraduate, that's the, the problem. In Germany at that time, we had the system of a diploma. I asked him about the development of SIM, for which he gave both from a theoretical perspective and a practical perspective, which are very different answers. Well, the, the ideas are, are around for many more years. So there's like papers from the 1960s. And why did he need a kick? to move his career forward and how many of us could learn from the advice that his friend gave him. Uh, he took me aside and said, hey, Reiner, you know, it's really important that you publish urgently a paper within the next six months. Otherwise, you're gone from here, basically. I also asked him what else he does outside of work to relax. I have a TV that has this polarization based 3D um, so you can you can watch 3D films on it. And interestingly, listening to how Rainer has had to deal with drink problems within his lab environment. Alcohol at work is, is a potential problem if that happens. All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Rainer Heinzmann. Rainer, hi. Hi, Pete. It's been a long time actually since I've seen you, partly because of lockdown, uh, which obviously we've been through, going through whichever way, wherever we are at this moment in time. But actually, you moved over, obviously, to Jena, and I only ever get to see you in conferences now. Uh, which, yeah, which is... that's, that's a pity. And now there are no conferences with Corona. Yeah, no. Uh, so, you, you know, at the University of Jena, that, I, I believe that's correct, or longer name is yeah, yeah. It's, it's Friedrich Schiller University of Jena so so Jena is kind of the proud city where uh, the German author Friedrich Schiller was staying for quite a while and so that's why they named the university after him well I think we'll come back to more about him later on throughout it so obviously I, I met you first when you were working at KCL uh, down at King's College London uh, Actually, yeah, it was through the conferences, I think, before associating you with KCL itself, and certainly Elmi, I think was probably one, some of the first meetings we were probably bumping into each other. Uh, I say bumping into each other because obviously you were quite renowned for your dancing. <laughs> well, well that, that's not a good sign if we bumped into each other a lot during dancing. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> well, but, El Elmi is well known for dance dancing parties. <laughs> no, I, I'd say bumped. I think you just probably bumped everyone off the dance floor as you took centre stage quite often. So where did your dancing come from? Because you're quite a nifty mover. Yeah, come on. No, I, I like dancing. I, I, uh, when I was in London, I actually went once a week to Imperial College for dancing lessons. Uh, what sort of dance? That was Latin, Latin dance. So like cha-cha, rumba, samba, jive. Yep. So, okay, so now I'm getting an idea. When we have a request at Anelmi, what sort of music to request to put on to get you on the dance floor? <laughs> How do you find a partner that can dance that sort of, it's not many that can do that type of dancing now, is there? Yeah, but you know, if you watch people, then you can, you can see who, who is capable of dancing these dances and then you can ask them hey <laughs> and after a few drinks they'll be incapable of dancing by the end of elmi nights <laughs> well me too <laughs> I, I do like this concept of strictly come dancing for microscopists or scientists 
<laughs> Are you going to run a show? <laughs> no, I'm just thinking that could be a whole new virtual event, couldn't it? <laughs> Probably. We'll get people to vote someone off at the end of each week. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, there you go. That's, that's a good one for Elmi this year. We'll have a virtual dance off and I uh, get people to vote off or keep voting people on until the end. And we'll see who wins them. No, that's that's too complicated. So let's let's take you right back to your uh, actually I, to your I'm going to take you further back. I was going to say take you back to your undergraduate days, but actually you sent me through some pictures. So thank you very much for those. So. <laughs> This one, hopefully showing, <laughs> well, yeah. long before your undergraduate days. So tell me a bit about this picture. Uh, obviously a very young you, but tell me more about it. Well, that was like a science fair that I, that I was on when I was like uh, in, in high school, basically. And um, that that basically just shows that even at that time I was I was already very interested in physics, and this is not optics; it's actually acoustics. I was doing some little project on generating sounds there, and, and I don't know if you remember the Commodore sixty four computer. Yeah, un unfortunately, I am old enough to remember the Commodore sixty four. Yes, <laughs> right. So, so I was soldering some little little bit for the user port, and then via this user port, I could output. Uh, sounds the way I wanted them, and then you could draw the waveform on the screen. There was something that's called a light pen. Have you ever heard of this? No. It's it's a device that you could draw on your screen on, and it would work with the Commodore 64. Ah. So and, and the trick is that at that time the screens were of course CRTs, ca cathode ray tubes. And they, they would basically, this light pen would just have an, a diode and it would, it would send like a trigger to the computer at the moment that the electron ray was passing. And because the computer was synchronized with the screen, it knew where the pen, where, where the ray is. And so it could tell the position this way. And how old were you at this point again? Well, that, that was 15 or something, but, but I didn't do this. Light pen was something you could just buy and plug in and it would work. Yeah, but you were still into that at the age of 15. Yeah, come on, but that was lots of fun. The funny thing is, I really wonder why this computer was so good at that time, because it it doesn't feel like a huge difference between what that little thing could do, and it had 64 kilobytes of memory, <laughs> to what you can do nowadays, right? Of course, there's differences, but they don't feel that big. So, so you also sent this picture, I presume this is you right at the edge of the picture. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that one I sent because that was it was a bit funny. This was probably the the only time I will ever get into the economy section of a newspaper, and this was a little uh, the local um, savings bank. They were running this this yearly game with school kids to learn how to how to um, place. Um, orders on the stock market. So they were giving you something like, I don't know what, like 50K play money, which was of course not real. And then you could just buy and sell any day what you want. And they would pretend that you do this with real money. And the, the people that won the most at the end of this game, they would win the game. And the funny thing was we actually did win the game, um, but we won it uh, because we made the least loss. Yeah, so it, okay. it, it it was the time of the Black Friday or what it was called, right? And so the whole stock market crashed in that time. And and we were just like not doing much. And that's why we, we didn't lose much. <laughs> and uh, the, the funny thing there was that this got me into contact to the people uh, at this um, savings bank. And I realized that they were, they, are, they were hiring these like 15 people to just do all the calculations for this. And I said, why do you do that? There's computers. And they said, what is a computer? And so I ended up writing a program for them so that they could save all, all the work and just in the morning type in the, the, the new stock market values. And then the computer would spit out everything automatically, basically. So you've had a, you had an impact in the financial markets. You proved yourself <laughs> not, not to really. be- It was just in this economy no. section because it was a game on this. 
you, you chose that you, you, you made the least losses. Uh, so, you know, you could have had a successful career outside of science and probably far more, uh, far more, uh, I, I can't say the word successful is very much the wrong word to use for obvious reasons, but certainly a far more wealthy career outside of science, but you chose physics for your undergraduate. So <laughs> remember, we made a loss, not a win. <laughs> less of a loss. So that was still a win, I guess. So, so, so why physics? Uh, I don't know. It's, um, I was always interested in physics, like probably fifth grade onwards or something like this. Um, it sounds like fun, right? To ask nature how it's working, more or less. Yeah, it always sounds like hard work to me, physics. Yeah, no, to me not, I don't know. It's, it's like optics. I always liked astronomy as a kid. I, I loved like going outside and watching the stars and things like this. No, I, 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 can, I can certainly empathize on that bit. I always remember looking outside my bedroom window and the star, sky, the sky. So actually I try and choose houses with the same view out of the bedroom window, the, the, the night sky. Uh, <laughs> on memories uh, of the constellations that I could see at that point. But I was very much novice. So you're, you did your undergraduate in physics. And is it correct that that was, so that your major was physics, but you had a minor of computer science? Yes. It was like um, you had the choice between computer science and chemistry. And most people did chemistry, but I always loved computer science. I was actually even thinking of maybe studying computer science rather than physics. But then before I started studying, I, I did also this work placement and I saw what happens to people that work for 30 years in computer science. And I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe you need something else. Uh, but, but look at computer science now. Uh, it still feels, and the computer science degrees just as a whole are still relatively new, they're, they're not, they're maturing still, I think, today. My son will tell me off because that's what he does. He's into maths with computer science. But hmm. it's, still, it's still a very fast developing field. And I, I guess it's the computer science has really enabled yourself to move forward as well. You know, do you think you could have been as successful without that background? I don't know. I don't know. I think it, success is, a, is always luck in a way. Yeah, um, computer science helped a lot. Yeah, that's... True. So if I, if I look at this, how long was your undergraduate diploma? Was it six years? Well, yeah, if you call that undergraduate, that's the, the problem. Germany at that time, we had the system of a diploma and um, you had 13 years of school. So um, I'm, fr I'm from the Western part of Germany, Lüneburg and um, afterwards, then you, you do two years until you're like, uh, th that is called the pre-diploma for diploma. And this is, I would say from the level, it's, it's comparable to, to a bachelor, but you didn't have to do any sort of uh, practical works. You had to, of course, do lab courses and stuff like this. And then there was like three or in my case, I think four years more to, uh, to finishing the diploma, including the diploma thesis. So that's a rather long time, right? So you're, you're age 26 or something when you're done with your first degree, but that was very, very normal. It would, would be like the, the average time at that time that, that it takes. Nowadays, I think it's a bit quicker, but it's still comparably slow. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Well, I, I don't know. I think for for society as a whole, it's probably a very bad thing, right? Because because you essentially the country pays you to study. In Germany, you do you don't have to pay anything, right? So it's it's free, um, and the the university has to be paid by society, and so from that perspective, it's bad. For for me, it was good. It was lots of fun um, because you could actually go and study anything and nobody would really ask questions. So, so I went to courses like computer linguistics or system sciences or all kinds of philosophy just for fun, right? I didn't need any of those, but why not? So, so at the end of that six years, uh, 
you've had quite you, you know to sample quite a lot of modules different flavors uh, your phd uh was now moving up to heidelberg uh and with chris kramer i, I think so christopher kramer's lab why did you choose to go I, I guess was that your first time to use microscopes or the first time into microscopy at that point yeah be before i did do optics so i was like, like my, my diploma was on some holography topic and so so i worked a lot with lasers and stuff like this um and uh i also did some work at the esrf um so it was x-ray scattering essentially and then i wondered why are people not applying what they know in x-ray scattering to light microscopy or to optics. And of course, I didn't really know too much about optics at that, that point, but um, it turned out that yes, the, the computer, uh, the, the X-ray uh, community has a much better like uh, touch to Fourier space than the optics people had at that time. And so that was interesting. Um, Heidelberg was more or less a coincidence. I, there was a, a newspaper an ad that was ad advertising PhD positions in Heidelberg in a graduate college on medical physics. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting, medical physics, why not? Um, maybe you learn some medicine and stuff like this on the way. And then I was actually wanting to talk to a medical physicist before I went there. And so I went to the hospital and talked to one. And afterwards, I knew 100% I do not want to do what this person is doing. But I applied anyway, because I thought it's a broader field. And it was, and it was a very good decision. And it was really great in Heidelberg, because you had these, these block weeks. It's almost like a, from the spirit, a little bit like, like courses you've been teaching and so on. It's, it's like these, these intense weeks where you, you have le lectures and exercises. Um, on all aspects of medical physics, like magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging and CT, and, and of course, also some basic courses on medicine and so on. And so that was a lot of fun. And especially because you didn't have to do any, any exams on these things. So you would just be learning that for fun. <clears throat> and so during that time uh, in Kramer Lab, I, I think you published your first SIM paper. I think, but your PhD wasn't on structural illumination. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's correct. Actually, sort of funny because I was hired for a different task there. My PhD or my, my, my job, so to say, was to look at microfractionation of nuclei under gamma irradiation. Yeah, so it was really more like a biology experiment. I, I had... I. I had to grow some cells and then irradiate them with, with, with gamma. And, and then I was supposed to look at what happens to the nuclei, how, how do they fractionate and so on. And I was not particularly interested in this very topic. Um, so I ended up doing a PhD on a completely different subject, which is more to do with computer science and, and image reconstruction, deconvolution and so on. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, sometimes it goes like this. And it, with SIM, it's similar. I, I just had this idea, I published the paper, but it didn't really fit into the other topics, the deconvolution bits and so on. And so I, in the end, I just left it out of the PhD because there was enough other things to, to write about. So looking at today's market, structural illumination microscopy uh, has been a big thing. It's, it's still a very big thing in the microscopy world. So is that one of your biggest impacts you think you've had on the market? And it's not, I, I know it's not just you. Uh, so obviously you've got Mats Gustafsson. So here's a question, who was first to come up with SIM? Well, the, the ideas are, are around for many more years. So there's like papers from the 1960s, uh, two, two very good papers by um, a guy called Lukosz. And, and he described, um, pretty much everything there is about SIM, except two very important ingredients were missing. One was fluorescence. It was what he was doing was about transmission imaging, not fluorescence. And secondly, um, 
he he didn't have cameras in the computer, so he had to do everything by decoding grids. So he did it almost like a spinning disk microscope, replacing the spinning disk with 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 a, a moving grating. Mm. And so that was practically pretty useless in a way, but it was the, the whole concept was there, right? He describes all the Fourier um, transforms that 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 you need to understand. Um, to, to understand the imaging process and so on. So that, that's that's interesting. But um, the, the first SIM paper I did um, was like essentially structured illumination along the lateral direction. Mats already had this, this fantastic work on what is called I5M. It's a very long name. I don't even know if I remember. It's like in, incoherent illumination image interference um, microscopy. Um, and that that is also structured illumination in the z direction, and it but it unmixes itself, and and then eventually I realized that you can unmix by taking several images and doing some math on them, and and then then this lateral sort of thing took off. I, at the beginning, my first paper in SPIE nineteen ninety nine, well the conference was nineteen ninety eight when I when I talked about this, um, that is that that's. I call this laterally modulated excitation microscopy, LMEM, right? And nobody, nobody uses this acronym at all anymore because Mats came up like with a much better acronym called SIM, Structured Illumination Microscopy in his 2000 paper. So you can say he invented SIM then because it's his acronym. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, you, you've never really stopped around that side and that, that's kind of where you made it. So you, you, Gosh, you've been lucky because you then went into uh, Thomas Jovin's lab as well, uh, which is another really big lab at Max Planck in Göttingen. Uh, so what was, what was your take? So that's going for your PhD to postdoc. Is there anything from the postdoc, you spent three years and then switched. And that, that's quite quickly to KCL to become a group leader. So you said how you were in studies for a long time so it was a long time to, you know, you didn't start a career really until you were 26 or even to a PhD. So arguably 99, 2000, when you finished your PhD. Yeah, I think just the end of 99 or something. Yeah. And yet, so it's a nice night. And yet in five years later, 2004, you became a group leader at KCL. Now that is really fast. So I don't think it hindered, did it? Well, I, I had a lot of catching up to do at the Max Planck Institute uh, because at the time I did my PhD, I had zero papers published. There was one paper submitted by that time and that what was published later. But at Max Planck, I, I really had to learn that it's very important to publish papers. And um, that, that was a hard thing to learn for me. I, um, you know, in a way, I still have this like, like when, you, when you do science, you, you find out something and once you know it, then you're happy and you're satisfied with your knowledge and, and why, why bother and tell everybody else about it, right? Why go through this pain of writing a paper? So that's sort of the feeling. And of course, now I know that it's super important to do this and to write papers. But uh, yeah, I had to learn that I think at the Max Planck Institute. I remember one, one day Quentin, uh, my sort of supervisor at the Max Planck, uh, or my, my colleague who worked with me directly, uh, he took me aside and said, hey, Reiner, you know, it's really important that you publish urgently a paper within the next six months, otherwise you're gone from here, basically. Yeah, and I think that was very good that he, he told me how the world works. So do you... How do you instill that now with your PhDs and postdocs? Or, or do they just know that? You know, I, I just assume that everyone knows the importance of, of publishing work and showing outputs. But do you still get students or postdocs that are slow to publish or slower than they should be to publish or resistant course, yeah. to publishing? So how, do you, how do you deal with that? It's, it's really difficult. I don't know. It's, um, I, I don't put much pressure on them. I, I do say that I find it very important and it's, it's almost like they get almost a paper at their entrance where it says publish or perish but 
uh, we, we are not really enforcing that. Um, and as a result, I have a whole mix, like some people have also zero papers published with their PhD. And in Germany, you can still uh, easily write a monography as a PhD. But nowadays we can also write uh, PhDs which are called cumulative so that you can um, base them on your publications. And I also have cases that have five first author publications by their PhD time or something like this, right? So it, it varies a lot. Who goes on to have the most successful careers out of those that came out with none and those who came out with five? Is there a correlation or not? Um, I think there is a co correlation, yeah, but it's it's still a widespread. Look 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 at Mats for example. Like he's he's probably one of the best, if not the best, scientist I've ever met, and uh, he has published very few papers only, right? And but the papers are all so good that he could make um, a name with it, right? Because they they are all spotless. Do we think? That in today's world, you can. I think there was there was a real emphasis on taking your time, getting really high impact in quality publications, and I I always feel now there's a rush to get publications out because you can't really go for your next grant application until you've shown outputs from your previous. So does that do you think that lessens the quality of publications? Increases volume but decreases the quantity and quality in a publication, or or not? Or is it a case that? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, that's hard to say. I, I'm, I mean, th th there's a certain drive also for high impact publications, but are they high quality? It's not always sure. They are at least polished in a way that they are easy to understand and, and, and they do have an impact if, if it is only a societal impact or something like this, right? But, um, yeah, it's hard to say, um, and but they are also important for grant applications and stuff like this because it it makes it easier, right? If you have if you have tons of nature papers, then then nobody's really asking questions about whether this is useful research or not because it's already proven, sort of, right? Yeah, I don't. I like in a way. Do you know Andrew York? Yeah, of course. So, so he he is he's working for a company you now, right? And he he was starting this this sort of initiative, trying to publish your own stuff, just open access um, with peer review um, by your peers in the open. And I think it's a brilliant idea, but the question is, is it going to take off or not? And it would be good if it if it was, right? But difficult. Academic, you need to have it published in an impact journal for your assessments and for the institute's assessments. Certainly in the yeah. UK, that's the way it, well, you know from your time at KCL, that's how it worked. Uh, I, 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 well, I'll come back to KCL in a moment. I'll ask you a question actually. What's your favorite, talking in publications, what is your favorite publication uh, for whatever reason? My favorite publication? That, that um, you've authored or co-authored? That I co-authored? Um, I don't know, well, um, Maybe it's either the, the one on nonlinear sim um, where I described the theory of this nonlinear sim. So that was 2002. Uh, but I al also quite fancy this publication with Keith Litke um, where we described that you can separate uh, blinking particles just by their, their time that they are blinking, right? Yeah. yeah so that, that, was, that was also cool, but it, it was only with quantum dots. And so you, you couldn't really do sort of fancy imaging. We, we call this idea pointillism because the idea was to, to make your images like tons of points on a screen, right? Like, like a, an artist. Yeah, and the beautiful thing about quantum dots, if there was two, three, four together, you could see the intensity drop equivalent. I, I remember looking at that with the, the five live when that came out. It was brilliant at making them blink. I'm not sure it's a good thing or bad thing for the five live, but it's certainly very, <laughs> very effective about watching the blinking in real time. Yeah. <laughs> And it, there's even a method, what we used is a method called independent component analysis. So that's some sort of pretty fancy statistical methods that can tell lots of these particles apart if they're independent blinking. So it's based on the stochastic independence of their blinking events. So I'm going to digress out a bit 
And this is getting outside of work because we've got a lot of heavy work stuff at the moment. But I, it's one. Which one is you on this? So this is a pic, where is this picture of you skiing? It's a beautiful picture, by the way. Um, that is a place in Switzerland called Sannenmöser. And which one oh. is you? Um, and on on like when I'm seeing your screen, it's the one on the left, isn't it? Yeah. So not the one on my shoulder. No, the other one. Yeah. <laughs> the other one. Yeah. Okay. I also know a bit. So you obviously enjoy your skiing. <laughs> yeah, that was very early on. Our parents took us. Uh, so I have a brother. Um, they they took us skiing very early on, like age six or five or so. so and you still ski? Yeah. If I can, but at the moment, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. But in normal times, so you, you still ski, uh, which is good. And is that why you moved away from KCL? Because obviously, there's not much skiing in the uh, in the UK. Well, in in a way, it was probably easier to to get to the skiing resorts from KCL than from here, because here we drive all the way, and so that's a pretty long drive from KCL. You just fly over, and then a short train ride, and you're there. So. I'll get coming back to KCL. This is obviously a big change because obviously you've, you've been through some great places, but now you land up in one of the biggest cities in Europe and you're starting your own group. So that must have been pretty daunting. So what, what did it, were you worried about starting your own group? Were you worried about moving to the city of London itself and setting it all up and getting PhDs, postdocs in your lab, finding funding? My God, these things are really daunting things. <laughs> mm, yeah, um, I wasn't so, so much worried. Like the, I, I did have an alternative. So originally I was offered a job at Worcester, Massachusetts. And I was just about to take it when Stefan Hell uh, took me aside and said, hey, Rainer, wait for a couple of days. There might be something else coming up. And so, so he connected me. To King's College, and and so then when I got this offer, and in the end I was, um, I was quite happy to change my mind and not go to the states and remain in Europe, um, and so and London was fun and I, I enjoyed it a lot, but for me it is too big of a city, so I I prefer I have this theory that people like the cities in which they grew up, and so I grew up in a hundred thousand inhabitants town and now I live in a hundred thousand inhabitants town and that suits me right. <laughs> so, so you moved back to Jena and the, your position is a physical chemistry over there? Yeah that's interesting right because I am really a physicist by heart uh, but physicists are needed in physical chemistry and so um, it's only a bit difficult if you're teaching the chemistry students and you you don't know what these chemical equations mean right <laughs> yeah i'm a biochemist so i actually had a good hardcore chemistry side to it uh, there's nothing wrong with a bit of chemistry uh so uh, on that note i was going to ask you what would you consider yourself because your biggest impacts have probably been on the field of biology it's come from the physics background using your computer science and now you're teaching chemistry which is pretty diverse so yeah, i'm not getting chemistry <laughs> but yeah <laughs> thermodynamics and stuff like this from time to time. So I presume you'd still count yourself as a physicist then? Yes. Not a biophysicist? No. Definitely a physicist? Yes. What's wrong but with When I studied, I, I went to a lecture of biophysics and it was all about membranes, right? It was about the thermodynamics of membranes and what are their different states and so on. So absolutely not my field. Oh. There's nothing wrong with membrane biochemistry <laughs> and biophysics. It's one of the best fields out there. I don't always, oh, you've insulted me. Well, I just said it's not my field. <laughs> <laughs> and yet so much of your work impacts that field as well, though. Uh, certainly on membrane biology and its architecture and infrastructure with the, the imaging itself. So ask a question. Who, who, who have you been your biggest inspirations, either at work or out of work? Well, like um, as, as a name, I would probably start with work. That would be Richard Feynman. So I, I read a couple of his books, of course, 
And so they're very inspirational from the way he lives, <laughs> but also the way he does physics. And actually he's written this three book series on physics that are very recommended. So um, they are really, really good. And they are not, they're, they're, they're quite light on the math side, but they're very heavy on the physics side. And so, but but very, very good explanation. So, so that was uh, great. I used them a lot in my studies. Um, Mats was also an inspiration to discuss with him the way he thinks about things was, was really great. But out, outside work, probably my father. Uh -huh. so, 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 so is that motivation just in life in general or with your work as well or? Well, indirectly with my work, like he, he, he um, fostered my interests as a kid. And so that's probably why I, I started to like physics and so on. So I don't know, do you know Fisher technique? It's so many kids play with Lego, right? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. But I didn't have much Lego. I had this other thing called Fisher technique and it's, it's, it's a bit like Lego, but it's three, more three dimensional because you can connect the bricks also like sideways and downwards and so on. So would your dad count himself as a physicist or a scientist? He he's a judge, but yeah. So um, he like like they're all judges and lawyers in my family. <laughs> that, that doesn't mean they're not scientific minded. Oh yes, you have to actually. It's interesting. Maybe many people don't know, but I think the whole field of law studies is very very mathematical in a way. I mean, they are not calculating or something like this, but they you have they're very logical, right? This this condition has to be met so that then this law applies and so on. And so you have to really think in a very mathematical frame in a, in a way. I, I'm just going to go back to your first inspiration with with Richard, and because I, I don't know his lifestyle. You said uh, inspiration from his lifestyle and his physics, but I've got to what? What's his lifestyle? I'm just intrigued. Well, you should read uh, this book called You're Surely Joking, Mr. Feynman. So it's a, it's a, it's a small book, highly recommended. It's, it's written it, by some tape recordings that he did with, with Leighton, I think, or so. Um, yeah, he was just um, crazy in a way, yeah? but in a good way. Um, it's, it's, it's a fun book. You're not going to give me any more. I'm intrigued now. That's yeah, a very yeah, good advert because I'm intrigued enough. Lots right of, of fun facts in there. So besides your inspirations, what about your hobbies? You know, what, what do you do in your spare time? Well, um, I, I, I play some music from time to time. So practice a little bit guitar and very recently also drums. But um, I heard you can't beat playing the drums. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was so bad, wasn't it? <laughs> Definitely true. <laughs> so carry on. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the the neighbors still have to come to terms with that hobby, right? <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I I would say, but in a way, what what you would call work is also my hobby, right? So if I I'm spend I spend a lot of my free time on work related things but they are not really work. They will maybe become work when they work. So um, it, like, like trying out crazy stuff um, at home to see if it works and so on. That's, that's lots of fun too. Can you give an example? I give away your next lot of research in advance. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, my brother presented me with a 3D printer and so I was trying to first trying to reproduce this UC2 stuff that um, that that Benedict Diedrich at, uh, at work came up with. And so I wanted to see, can I can I do that at home and so on? But now I'm, I'm trying to make some changes to it and and come up with new ideas of, of how to cheaply construct optical instruments and so on. So you, you I presume you're having to code into the 3D printer to get the structures you're wanting. Is that right? You, you have to code, no. Um, you, you have to learn computer edit design, right? So there's, there's programs. I'm trying to use a program called FreeCAD now that is totally free. And uh, yeah, you, you, you have to design things. And that, that takes a little bit of getting used to. So 
steep learning curve. And, and how much? Uh, uh, how much are the the wax, the plastics, the, the polymers, whatever you put into the printer? How is it an expensive hobby, or is it? Actually, not at all. Not at all. So yeah. the printer itself was, I think, less than two hundred euro. Yeah. And the material is about depends on the quality that you buy between ten and twenty euro for one kilogram. Okay. But one kilogram gets you one year of printing or something like this. Dep I, depends how much you print, of course. Yeah, but so that's, it's, that's cheaper than an inkjet. Yeah, in a way, in a way, it is. Yeah, yeah. it's a lot cheaper than. Trust me, the amount of, it costs to change the ink and the ink. Yeah, it's a lot cheaper. But it was kind of cool. You can you can nowadays download so much stuff from the internet uh, also to print. So that that means when I was going, for example, in in summer holiday, I was going on a little bike tour with my girlfriend and uh, I just printed the night before we left, I printed a little plastic holder for a bottle that I could screw on my bike. So then, then I had a water bottle always with me during biking, right? Things like this. Or if, if uh, from, from my rucksack that there was something that broke off and I just, I downloaded the part, printed it, one hour printing time or something like this and you plug it in and it works. So, so it's pretty strong then as well. Well, you, you, yeah, the end of the story is <laughs> um, when, like, shortly before finishing the bike tour, this, this thing broke and the water bottle was on the floor. And uh, the rucksack thing is also broken by now, but it lasted for like half a year or something. Uh, fun to make as well, I guess. Yeah. And in any color. I suppose you could do it in any color you wanted as well. Of course. Yeah, you should look at our lab where they print this UC2 stuff. They have them in in fluorescent pink and all kinds of colors. And, and how long, we're completely digressing, but that little cube you had, how long would it take to print that? Um, it, was only, it was only about what? It, it depends on the three quantity. Centimeters by three centimeters. So how long would it take to print that structure? Yeah, this, this is five by five centimeters. And uh, it depends, like when, when I printed this with pretty low quality, so then it takes about like one to two hours, I would think. Um, but uh, if you print it with higher quality, it takes a bit longer because then it has to do finer layers. So, yeah. but that's okay. And it's in a way, it's a, it's a satisfying feeling that you have the printer working for you while you're doing something else, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> So you can do your whatever email responses and then always look a little bit to the side. Is the printer done by now? So, so, so it's given me an idea what to get my son for his uh, birthday present coming up. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully he won't watch this beforehand. <laughs> Otherwise, I've just ruined his birthday present. <laughs> that would be so good. But I know he'd love, absolutely love to have, or one of my sons would actually love to have a 3D printer. So definitely. What about sport? Do you, you ever got into any team sports? Well... <laughs> Um, not really. When, when I was really young, I was for a very short time in a football, um, like a soccer club, but that didn't last long. I always wanted to be like the goalkeeper, but they didn't want me as a goalkeeper. And, and they, once they put me on the spot as a test and there was like, I remember that there was like 10 people firing balls at, at the goal and I was trying to hold them and they said, ah, you're rubbish, <laughs> get out. And so then I left the the football part and uh but finally what what really put me off in a way from team sports is um that i once had an, an accident uh when we just as a warm-up played some basketball and uh my feet got entangled with somebody else's feet and that person fell flat on the face more or less and broke broke off two teeth in the front and so i thought oh this is too dangerous this this contact sports and so I try to stick to something where there's always a clear barrier between you and your opponent. But so I, I, I'm going to pick you up on two points. One, your legs got entangled. I'm sure is what most professional footballers says when they actually deliberately foul someone else. Uh, they then say <laughs> they quit because they're banned from the sport. And then you say you like this non-contact stuff and yet isn't one of your, didn't you say one of your hobbies was judo earlier on? No, I didn't say that. Uh, that was also when I was a kid. Actually, that was when this happened. That was the warm up for a judo session. But interestingly enough, um, 
I think I'm daring to say judo is possibly less dangerous than football because it's very well regulated, especially as a kid, because then you don't do the, the nasty stuff like the, um, I don't know how you call it, the lever, lever moves with arms and so on. That That is not so healthy, but. Okay, so, so it's controlled. So, okay, so what other sports have you gone have you do, do you enjoy doing or have enjoyed doing just to see how non-risky these the, the, this is in relation go on <laughs> okay so i did table tennis when i was a kid okay Re relatively safe relatively safe yeah and um well in school time a little bit of badminton yeah then yeah that's really bad for your knees badminton then of course dancing and yeah and horse riding ah yeah, my, my, my mom had a horse, and so that's why we had to try it. But um, then, yeah, then once the horse didn't want me on its back anymore, and I, I, I sort of survived, I didn't even fall down. I was like, when, when the horse calmed down, I was hanging like like Winnetou at the side of the horse. <laughs> but but I think then I stepped down and said, oh, maybe not, not again. <laughs> uh, kayaking? Yeah, um, also as a kid, but I, I like, I, I quite enjoy doing it even nowadays. We, from time to time, we, we do our group, outing, group outings with, with, as a kayak trip or canoeing trip. That's always fun. I take it this isn't white water stuff. This is just... No. It, just... Stuff. Okay. it, it tends to be quite a popular thing amongst my cross is, uh, is kayaking. I, I know Alison North really likes kayaking. I know Jennifer Lippicott Schwartz loves kayaking. Yeah, it's 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 also fun for holidays. Like when I was smaller, we went like with my cousin, we went to Sweden for like two weeks of kayaking from lake to lake and stuff like this. Lots of fun. That's all right. Mention that you 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 very rapidly uh, went from doing a PhD onto becoming a group leader. So you could say that you are a, a high flyer, which I presume. Ah, <laughs> if I duck out the way, this is you in a glider. Yeah, that that's in a way it's it's a sad story because. Um, I, you can start gliding very early. So I started at age 14 with this and, and I did my license also um, with 17 or 18 or something like that. And then I did it quite intensely for many years. And then when I moved to Heidelberg, I stopped. But uh, then I started taking it up in Jena again. In England, I didn't do it. Um, but I finally decided now to stop it, um, maybe for good, because it's in a way, it's too dangerous. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I finally, I realized because Jörg Langowski, uh, you might remember him, he, he uh, had a fatal gliding accident. And uh, that was not the first person that I knew personally um, who didn't survive this. And so that's why I said, let's stop it. Uh, if, I, if I just put my head here, maybe this is close. I want to get to actually flying a, para, a, a glider. <laughs> well, the gliders are, are fairly safe, right, um, compared to many other planes, but um, they, they honestly are, but but still still you're flying, right? You, and normally humans don't spend so much of their time in the air. So we, we, we've looked at a lot of the, the, the hobby stuff. Going back to, to work, uh, it looks like you've, you've obviously sampled quite a few things, enjoyed a lot of things outside of work. What about problems at work? Have you ever had any, what's the most difficult time you've encountered in your career and how have you overcome that? Have you ever encountered anything challenging or have you learned a charm yeah. to drive through it? I guess there's always like these, these personal situations at work, rarely, luckily very rarely, but sometimes you have um, group internal differences that some members of the groups can't stand others. Um, that can be challenging. There can be uh, other things that may be difficult, um, like, um, for example, alcohol at work is, is a potential problem if that happens. And sometimes it's, it's very difficult to even realize what is going on, right? Um, so these are, these are challenging moments, I would say, but other than that it's always fun and there's there's a lot of fun moments and i always had a great group 
Yeah, that'll be the alcohol that makes it great fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and partly that's also true, but it can also be the opposite. So, is that I've got to? Is that personal experience with the alcohol at work, or is it people in the lab? Or yeah, twice, twice personal experience. Okay, but I, um, that that sounds tough to recognize that. So that must be to to acknowledge that to. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's really difficult. I, I mean, personal experience as as members right in the lab um so it's it's difficult to realize this like usually i didn't realize it myself it was people coming to me that say you should talk to this and that that person there's something really wrong here yeah so in in, in one case it was even a sales rep so even my own group didn't tell me about that problem it was a sales rep that says something is wrong here gosh so 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 was that like no i won't ask where that was because that that helps oh, no, no. But, that. Um, did, that. Did, you, you never had any sort of experience in that direction with with your group members or no no there's always very different characters and i think that's one of the joys of it, it it's quite a diverse group uh and that come and go but no i've been really fortunate uh, either that or very ignorant and not noticed, uh, but I'm fairly confident <laughs> knowing the individuals and, and as they've always gone on that, that they've not had any drink or drug problems. But, yeah, you know, I mean, the, the problem is also then where, where do you, like, if you don't interfere at all, that's bad, but you should of course also not interfere too much because it's still a personal uh, decision of that people, right? So as long as it doesn't affect work, it's not your business. It, but but I guess we are there in in some cases it depends I guess depends on their position but as their boss I think we are but we are their mentors as well yeah yeah uh, and and we are there to to guide I guess and actually thinking about it no we have had people on on a, on a wider team that have had problems but I've not had to deal with that firsthand so how did you approach them did you give any advice or any structure or or was it that you you were too Far too distant from them uh, of the problem. No, well, I I, I had to talk, uh, of course, yeah. But luckily, there's also you can get lots of help um, from university in these cases, right? They had they have um, uh, some professional advice of how to handle situations like that, and it's it's probably a good idea to take that advice, right? Because um, it's not easy to handle this. <clears throat> No, I, and you're absolutely right. And I think actually universities in general are great employers. They, they, they have so yeah. much in the way of support uh, around it. As much as many will criticize uh, the little things, if you look at the bigger picture, actually, I think, I think they're pretty good uh, and, and very good employers in, in the main, I think. I can hear people now screaming at me saying, no, it's not the case, but I think when you reflect and take a bigger picture, they are actually excellent. I, yeah, I, I think I'm very fortunate. York has been tremendously good. And I, I think you're sitting there. I, I think you've probably had very similar experiences, both through KCL into Yena, have been good places to work. Yeah, yeah, I can agree. What's it like as a, I, I, it is a city, but it's almost a town, Yena. <laughs> Uh, what's, it, what's it like as a place to to live and work uh, it's it's quite beautiful actually it's it's funny because when when you are first here well there's there's one thing most people know Jena from passing by on the autobahn uh, on the motorway and and that is a big problem because the the part of Jena that you pass by is sort of the most ugly part of Jena so it's like this skyscraper type of Thing and people think, ah, oh, that's really an ugly city. But then the downtown Jena is really beautiful. And the setting is really beautiful because when you are here, you think like you're in the mountains. Yeah? It looks like you're you're man, not quite in the Alps, but in a, in a little mountain range. But it's not true. It's just that this river Saale carved a really deep valley into a flat area. So once you hike up to the top of the hill, you realize, oh, there's no mountains here. This is all pretty flat up here. Uh, I, I, I've been to Yena uh, a few times. But I've never got to explore it to any great depth. Uh, so I, I should take more time 
when I come over. That, yeah. That's for sure. And because of that, it's a very long and small city. You understand? It's not not round, but it's it's along the river in the valley. So now, totally different to York, which is very flat, despite being associated with the Yorkshire Moors and the Yorkshire Dales and the big hills that are around. York itself is dead flat and is is round because we have got the city city walls all the way around us. Yeah. But at least yeah. you get a view from the city walls. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, or York Minster, the highest point in York. So if we wanted a good view, you go to the top of the Minster and you can see for miles around because there's nothing in the way. It is yeah, the highest nice. point. Nice. Uh, so over all of your career from, from school through to your undergraduate, PhD, postdoc, KCL, Yena, what's been the most enjoyable time? Well, if you look back with rose tinted glasses, what's what's the most what have you enjoyed what period of time have you enjoyed most um i would probably say the time in heidelberg so my phd time was the most enjoyable is that the city the beautiful but also like um social life and so on was was really great there so and a lovely city as well lovely city yeah. very nice people you have to say that because some of them will be actually tuning in and watching or listening this. You have to say they're nice people. Yeah. I, also, I mean, also the science settings are uh, setting is really good. Like the EMBL up on the mountain. There's also Max Planck Institute there, university. At the time I was there, it it was still a downtown city that that I was. But now everything is what they call Neuenheim in Neuen, Neuenheimer Feld. But uh, cool, really nice. Some quick fire questions, completely different now. At home, what would you rather do? Read a book or watch TV? I probably enjoy more reading the book. Unfortunately, I watch too much TV. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what sort of TV vice? Do you, is it films or TV ep or comedy or TV episodes? What's your genre? What do you like? Um, well, crime stories probably is what, what I mostly watch. Uh, and Eat in or eat out? Um, at the moment, eat in. But it used to be eat out, right? So at the moment, it's just because there's no, you cannot eat out. But normally, I, I go eating out quite a lot. Okay, so let's think. German food, Italian, Chinese, Asian. Go on, what's your favorite food type? Um... Most of the time that I eat more fancy food is Vietnamese. We have a very good Vietnamese restaurant here. Um, however, I quite enjoy Indian food as well. It's just that Jena, it has one Indian place, but it's not, for my taste, not the greatest. But in London? Of course, yeah, there's lots of Indian food. You have to be a bit careful if it's not too hot what they serve you, right? Uh, don't go there. The hottest food I've ever had was actually in Heidelberg. So okay. <laughs> At an Indian place? No, it's Thai. Okay. Yeah. Uh, drinking beer or wine? Wine. Red or white? Uh, more white than red. I'm glad you said that and not rose. <laughs> Just <to laughs> <be> <laughs> careful in there. Tea or coffee? Um, I would say tea. But I drink both. I, I drink coffee in the morning, one cup. Actually, this morning I made me a cup of tea and a cup of coffee. <laughs> Extravagant. So <laughs> London did have an influence then with a cup of tea as you came through. You, you play your musical instruments. Uh, what music do you like to listen to? Um, all sorts, actually. Um, sometimes classical music, but, but also um, I like this sort of Latin funk rhythms a little bit, jazzy sort of things. I don't like, like you know, Jamiroquai or um, I like some old stuff like Super Tramp. Yeah, okay. No, I'm with you on those. I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's quite cool. I like a bit of JK. So I'm good. And what about your favorite film of all time? Whew. Tough questions, I know. Science, you got yeah. answers like that. First, whoa, go on. Favorite film. 
that's that's a hard one i don't know i i, I don't have one um i would say oh, really I, I i like the hobbit series for example so i like fantasy stuff as well okay that's it the, the, the hobbit series so not lord of the rings lord of the rings as well but the hobbit is in 3d so that's <laughs> lord of the rings unfortunately not I, I, so you like the 3D films and 3D? Yeah, that's actually fun. I like watching them, yeah. I have a TV that has this polarization-based 3D. Um, so you can you can watch 3D films on it. I, I just find them gratuitous. Just to, It almost seems half the time it's for 3D for the sake of being 3D. And the bits you want to be 3D generally go back to 2D. I'm always lost. I've got a couple more bits for you. You sent me this image. Uh, <laughs> So I guess is uh, as close as I'm going to get. I actually wore the shirt to match it. Look, I can't see. There you go. I actually wore a shirt. It was as close as I could get to match your image. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so this image is sort of uh, many people might know it from from my talk. So this is that sort of a zoomed in version of what I use for my talks to demonstrate structured illumination. And so, if you overlap it with another grating. Uh, you see actually this this uh, figure of Ernst Abbe. But the funny thing is, if you turn that grating, then you, you see Friedrich Schiller. And so that's that's the, the guy who gave the name to our university. I, I also found that if you enlarge and shrink the picture, you can start to see the images just by expanding and contracting them within PowerPoint. Not the one image anyway. Because there's a more ray form between yeah. the pixels on the screen. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so I, I thought that's really cool. Wow, that's really cool. Unfortunately, I can't do that with backgrounds. Uh, yeah, I just saw earlier, actually my chair here, you see has also some structured illumination effect. It's a bit difficult to see here. Yeah, off the back, the, the, the vent at the back. Yeah, yeah. And uh, actually, I, I, I'd be really wrong not to not to finish on, a, <laughs> on, on this picture. So this... I, I, so you're a nature lover as well, by the looks of it. <laughs> looks like it, right? <laughs> so, so this is, you must have, what, been one and a half? I don't what really know, to be honest. That's a very old picture. You, you have much more experience having age like this, yeah. Could be, too, something. <laughs> and I noticed the diffraction grating just behind you at the back, just above your head, look. <laughs> the fence? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the fence. Give you your first uh, pattern on that. <laughs> so, just to finish, uh, if you had someone starting out today, uh, looking at careers, what advice would you give them? Well, my advice would be you should do what you fancy most, right? So, do the things that you really love. Of course, you have to sort of to keep the world around you happy. But as long as you're doing what, what, you, what you love yourself, then, then this will make you having success in your field, right? Yeah, and to enjoy yourself outside of work. So I, I've, seen you at, I've seen you at plenty of conferences and I know that your dancing is a legendary. I, I, that's for sure. <laughs> and it's important to be able to let your hair down. That's, uh, mind you, not, not, I've got a huge amount of hair to let down, but you're certainly in a better place than I am on that one. Yeah, not not so long at the moment, I hear, but... <laughs> Rainer, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been great to catch up. It's been too long. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and see you hopefully very soon. See you soon. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the dash microscopists.